Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Casual Climbers, the podcast by and for beginning hikers and those who may not quite be physically ready to tackle the Appalachian Trail. I'm your host, Roy Padrick, and alongside me, as always, is my wife and adventure buddy, Donna. Hi, Roy. Hey, Donna. In this podcast, we're going to provide you with information, tips, and tricks on how to get into hiking in the Blue Ridge area. We're going to cover some of the hundreds of trails in the various parks in the region and hopefully entertain you along the way. We're two middle-aged, not-in-the-best-shape hikers. I didn't say it. Who love the outdoors and want to share our experiences with you. In this week's episode, Donna, we cover the really fun Ravencliffs Falls Trail at Caesars Head State Park. We're also going to talk a, a little bit about this really great shop. It's a coffee shop and sandwich shop that we hit afterwards. So for, for those of you hikers who are like, hey, can you guys tell us where to eat after we get done with this really long hike? Yeah. This week, we got you covered. Right. You want to reward yourself after a hike. Um, you you want to have something in your stomach before a hike, but it's a lot of fun to know that, you know, I think the rules is, is the rules are that after you hike, I think like for what, six hours after you hike, the food you eat, it doesn't count. It doesn't yeah, everything's free. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, everything's free. It, so any calories you consume six hours after a hike is completely free. It just goes straight through your body. Just to say, we're not nutritionalists. We, we are not doctors. So <laughs> yeah. everything we said is a big old lie. Yeah. <laughs> but we, I mean, it could be true. We don't it, know. Yeah, I, it's not true. It's not true. <laughs> We also have a fun fact today about Devil's Kitchen, yeah. which is right there at nearby Scissors Head State Park in the Welcome uh, the visitor, Center area. Yeah. Visitor mm -hmm. Center. And our equipment review this week is Kamut, the app that I use to track our hiking. Mm -hmm. So this week's fun fact I am really looking forward to. Listeners, I am hearing this for the first time along with you, and I can't wait to hear it. So what do you say, Donna? Ready to get into it? Let's go. Today's trail is Ravencliff Falls. Now here it is by the numbers. The distance for this trail, it's an out and back trail, 3.9 miles from the trailhead. The time it took us overall was two hours and 30 minutes at a very comfortable pace. And of that, one hour and 38 minutes was actual moving time. And you'll see why as we go through it. And if you look at our trail photos on our website, you'll see why we spent a whole hour stopping and enjoying. The lowest point of the trail is 2,800 feet, and the highest point is 3,000 feet, but do not let that 200-foot difference fool you, because this is a break-a-sweat plus trail. And it is very, it, it's very pet-friendly and kid-friendly. Overall, the, the hike footing is not challenging. But we're going to tell you what's really challenging about it. Donna, what is really challenging about this trail? So you got these ups and downs. They're gentle ups and downs. But you go up for, I mean, it's long enough that I got out of breath and had to take a break um, halfway through, you know, going up. Um, it was, yeah, just take a break. I mean, because if you don't, you're going to feel like you're going to have a heart attack. It is kind of nuts at only 200 feet. And I didn't believe it when I, when I got back and looked at the Kamut statistics and it said it was only 200 foot elevation. I'm like, no, this app is lying. Mm, it's not true. Total. But it, it, it is from the lowest to highest point. But, right. But you're going up and down, up and down, oh, up and down. You're going. So much. Yeah. You're going over that mountain. Like it, it, it's really, it's beautiful. It is beautiful. And you know what's really interesting about this, about this hike? With the exception of, of the apex of it, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit, there's so many really interesting and beautiful rock and boulder formations yeah, along this trail. For sure. One of my favorite uh, is this kind of double rock trail. It's not really a trail. It's this double rock formation, but it's plenty big enough and flat enough that you could sit and have a picnic at, and it's kind of tiered. So there's one, and this is maybe, what, a 15 mile? feet off of the trail itself? Yeah. About a mile in, yeah, about a mile in. 15 feet off the trail, and it overlooks 
this nice little yeah the overlook view. It's, it's a be- it's a beautiful view yeah so you could have like two families sitting and having a picnic on these rocks a mile into the trail it's it's gorgeous and when we went this past summer there were actually people having a picnic there mm-hmm. yeah yeah i mean there's there's no like guardrails to to make sure that you don't go off the mountain so don't don't do that maybe try not to do that but yeah. it, Honestly, though, it's not like it falls straight down. There's plenty of trees to in the catch way. You yeah, I mean, it's not too bad. <laughs> but it is, it is a nice formation. And, and there's like, there are two or three spots where the rocks jut out from the side of the mountain and kind of form this natural overhang slash cave. Mm-hmm. And I always imagine I'm going to find a bear in these. Now, listeners, these overhangs are probably at most. 18 inches tall. <laughs> so so if there was a bear in there, it'd be an adorably little bear. Yeah. Yeah. Like so maybe a care bear. Maybe, I'm not sure. care. <laughs> I think I would freak out more if it was a care bear <laughs> in real life rather than a real bear, because I'm pretty sure I would have accidentally put some strange mushroom in my mouth. <laughs> Which is a real possibility. It is a real possibility. Okay, listeners. So we, we, I guess we should get this out of the way. We're in episode eight now, so you can get to know a little bit about us. Donna, I have, I have a weird quirk about me. Do you want to tell them? I mean, I, if, if I say, oh, that's an interesting mushroom, and you're like, you want me to put it in my mouth? And the funny thing is, is that you don't like mushrooms. I hate mushrooms. They're disgusting fungus. I, but wh- it's not just mushrooms, though. It's really kind of anything. I hope it's not anything. I haven't, like, witnessed you put... Well, yeah, berries you would try, but I don't... Yeah, do you remember that plant in Florida, or that tree in Florida? Actually, two trees in Florida. So, we we used to live in Florida, and we took this road trip down south. Oh, yeah. And we stopped at this restaurant Mm -hmm. that had these little green apples. Yeah, they were like, almost like crab apples, little little tiny apples growing on a tree Mm -hmm. outside the restaurant, and... They, they, they very obviously looked like fruit, but they were all over the ground. They were all over the tree. They were very, and, and that kind of confused me because I thought, well, wh- why aren't the squirrels and the birds eating? The-? Because they were tiny little sweet looking apples. But yeah, so Roy, you picked one. I picked one because they look delicious, listeners, to be fair. I mean, they did look delicious. I did not put one in my mouth. Yep. Put put one in my mouth. Took a bite. It wasn't a big bite. Yeah, it was. A I'm little... not. I'm not a complete idiot. You're it, not. But it was a bite, yeah. and it turned out to be a manchineel, which is called the death apple. Yeah. And the world's most dangerous tree. Which. And it's crazy because you looked it up afterward, and what was special about that particular apple? Do you remember? I remember that Native Americans who lived in that area would take that, that the, I guess the juice from that apple and coat their arrows with it and they would poison their arrows with it to shoot at like, you know, their enemy. Yeah, that's what got Ponce de Leon. Yeah. He was shot with one of these. So, so my dumb butt is putting that stuff in his mouth and I also put this um, bark from a tree in the Enchanted Forest Sanctuary in Brevard County, Florida, in my mouth, and it turned my whole mouth numb. Yeah. And it turned out that the natives used to use that for toothaches. Yeah. And so my mouth was numb for the entire rest of the day. That I don't was... know why anybody has Ambisol. Just grow one of those trees because your mouth will be numb for the rest of the day. Yeah. So that's a, that's a sidebar right. from, from our trail. I feel like I do any... put stuff in my mouth. If any, yeah, if any like life insurance person out there is listening. I just I just want you to know he's really not trying to kill himself or anything. He's he is balanced and healthy and happy. Um he just this is something that he does. It's weird. I don't know. I don't know where I get it. It has to be some childhood thing, I think. I don't know. Putting stuff in my if if my mom listens to this, which I don't know if she does, but if she listens to this, um I'm sure she will tell you that this happened to me as a child we and should... I'm a 48-year-old adult who is still doing this. Yeah, we should have her as a guest. She's got some stories, no, I'm sure. No, we're not having her as a guest. We totally Absolutely need not. To... Nope, not going to happen. She'd be hilarious. Let's get back to the trail. <laughs> okay. So one of the there's there's a lot that's interesting about this trail besides the up and down nature of it. So normally on these trails 
it's up one way most of the most of the time and down the other. Like in Sulphur Springs is a perfect example. You start low, the first half is going to the top of the mountain, and the second half is coming down. That's normally how trails are designed. But this one, man, it is. Sometimes you're going up, sometimes you're going down, Which and is it's the nice. exact same way on the way back. Yeah, it's nice in in a sense because you in I don't know what like four times in the trail you get these long breaks where you're going down or even with the land, and so you get these long parts of the trail where you're not huffing and you know going up. So I don't know. That's that's nice in a sense. Yeah, I don't I don't have any complaints about it. It's it's just different than most trails. It's still good. I I enjoyed this hike and for the for a number of reasons, the apex is perhaps the best one. But there's also this there's this section, Donna, you remember, a dense canopy of mountain laurels. Yeah. That lasts a pretty long while. It's probably maybe a quarter mile of just a dense canopy of mountain laurels and we went in the summer it was midsummer and there were still some not a lot but there were still some mountain laurels on the trees so the flowers right yeah mountain laurel flowers so when we go in the fall or, or in the spring, spring yeah i can imagine it's going to be almost magical yeah oh, yeah that's definitely we'll definitely have to schedule this one for i think probably late april i think that's a good call yeah yeah. And so today's weather wasn't too bad. Right. We got there, it was about 42 degrees mm-hmm. when we got there. And uh, I didn't I didn't feel overly cold. We didn't, I didn't wear gloves. I think you took yours off pretty early. Pretty early, yeah. I mean, it, this is February 9th. It's supposed to be the coldest month, I believe, in this area. And today was not bad. I, I started with a hat, scarf, and gloves. But they, they all got, went in my backpack probably within a mile in. Several trails fork off this one, too. So there's kind of like this network of trails that run through Caesars Head State Park. And there's one in particular, listeners, that you should be on the lookout for. And there's a big, bold sign, metal sign, which is unusual in state parks and forests, nailed to a tree that says, you are preparing to go on the dismal trail if you are an inexperienced or novice hiker do not take this it's so we chose not to do it we debated back and forth about going on it and here here's what it is the dismal trail is only 1.5 miles but in that 1.5 miles it's an out and back it's not a loop there is a 2000 foot elevation change from the top where you start it on the Ravencliff Falls Trail to the bottom where it picks up the Natural Wood Trail. It's 2,000 feet and one and a half miles, listeners. That, For those of you who have never hiked, that is an insanely strong grade going yeah. up and down. Yeah, so this is, this is pretty close to the overlook, the Ravencliff Falls right. overlook. We, we considered it. Very briefly, I did take a picture of the sign. The sign says, warning, the dismal nature land hiking loop is very strenuous. Expect at least an additional four to six hours of hiking from this point. For your safety, do not attempt this loop unless you have water, food, hiking boots, and a trail map. Um, I'm thinking that this sign should say really good muscles, really good balance, no hip problems, no knee problems, things like that. Right. Yeah. So... I, I want you to think about that, listeners, what that means. So the dismal trail and you called it the natural wood or? Natural land. Natural land, thank you. The natural land trail is only about 2.8 miles total for the both of them. And they're saying it's going to take four to six hours. Right. And I think it has been described as, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's the hardest hike in South Carolina. Yes. Many, many like experienced, experienced hikers say it is the most difficult hike in South Carolina. So, listeners, you're going to pass by it, and it's going to seem very tempting. Because at the bottom, once you get there, you can get to the bottom of Ravencliff Falls. 
But just remember, you got to go back up. And that is when it becomes challenging. Going down that street, that steep in, uh, de decline is tough. I don't recommend it without two hiking poles. We're not saying this from experience either. We're just saying this from what we read about it because we, we, we like I said, we considered doing it for about a minute and a half just because it's a mile and a half. It sounds easy. And it's right off of this trail that we're already on. So there were reasons to consider doing it. Yeah. But then once, thank goodness we had some, some cell signal up at the, up at the top. A and, tiny little bit that kept going in and out. Yeah. yeah. And that sign, that sign has like this comical V that is like, okay, you're going to be going straight down and then straight back up. This V is showing you what you're about to do if you take this trail. So all of that is to say, listener, if dismal natural land hiking loop is very strenuous. Only, only really take it if you're fully prepared I, I'm for thinking, a full day of hiking with complete gear. Yeah, and maybe, maybe you should, I mean, because if you're listening to this, then maybe you're a casual climber who is unfit, just like us. So before you do the dismal, natural, whatever, loop, <laughs> maybe talk to a therapist. <laughs> I'm just... At the, at the very least, make sure that people know what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So that if you don't come back within six hours, they know at least where to start The looking. parking lot closes at five. Just just know that. Yeah, we should probably talk a bit about parking a little bit. Yeah. So parking for the trailhead is about half a mile past Caesars Head State Park coming from the south side. And it's on the right-hand side and the trail is on the left. So you have to cross the, the road. I'm not going to call it a highway. It's a two-lane road. but there are curves on either side, so when you cross, please be careful and pay attention. And there's only maybe maybe 20 spots there, probably closer to 16. And, and it is a very, very, very popular trail in the area. There is, however, and this is new because this didn't exist last time we went in, in June. Either that or we didn't notice it. Yeah, it, I think um, it's new. Okay. There's fine. a little bit of overflow parking. We're going to say it's new. Yeah, it's new. Okay. Uh, past the paved parking area, and the overflow parking is not paved. So at least they've recognized that they need more because people were parking on the side of the road. I'm not going to say if we did it or not, but yeah. people have parked on the side of the road, and you'll get ticketed you'll for You'll get it. ticketed because it's dangerous, because the, the, the drop-off from the paved road to the dirt where two of your tires have to be on the dirt, your your vehicle has to be kind of leaning at such an angle that it it felt like, hmm, is this vehicle going to just roll off the mountain? Oh, it's a good eight to twelve inches from the paved to the yeah. to the grass. I don't recommend yeah. doing what we might have done. We didn't do it. We, <laughs> we totally didn't do that that one time and get a ticket for it. Yeah. So, so that's the parking situation there. We, so we went on a Friday, on a work day, and so there wasn't anybody there. We, the only time we ran into anybody was on our way back about halfway through. So that was kind of nice. So if you can go during the work week, by all means do it. It gets exceptionally busy on the weekend. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. And it's, so it's, it's February now. The last time that we hiked it was in the end of May, and I... I mean, I'm going to guess that the nicer the weather, the nicer the weather is, the more people, I don't know. We, well, we... You, you remember when we got back to the, to the vehicle today, mm. that main parking lot was already full. That's true. And that, that was true. at like noon on a Friday. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We got, yeah. So maybe get an early start. Okay. So we've teased at it, Donna. What's at the apex of this? At the apex of the, the, the Ravencliff Falls is the view, the view of the Ravencliff Falls. It's just amazing. It's breathtaking. It brought tears to my eyes. I, you, when you get about, I want to say, 20 feet from the overlook, you can start to hear the falls. The, the trees, I mean, right now the trees have lost their leaves. So it's amazing to me how much the trees still muffle like the sound of the falls. The falls are really far away, too. Yeah, so that's, that's something that people often complain about is, oh, you're going to 
call this Ravencl- Ravencliff Falls Trail and you have an overlook, but it's a mile away. It is, folks. It's a mile away. But you get a great view of it. Yeah. From, from, from the, the, there's a great pavilion there. Mm-hmm. There's plenty of seating. I mean, it's probably the nicest end of trail pavilion I've seen at any state park. Well, well maintained. Just, just beautiful. There's a, there's a top gazebo pavilion kind of thing it has and then, benches all around mm-hmm, and then you can go down the stairs and go to another landing a little bit lower so um if you do go down to the landing that's a little bit lower whoever's standing at that landing and enjoying the falls their heads are not blocking the view of the of the raven cliff falls from the people that are up in the gazebo up at the top but yeah, we got lots of pictures. We'll put those. Yeah, we'll put the pictures up on the website. The falls themselves are about 350 feet tall. So it is, it is a significant waterfall, listeners. It's, it is beautiful. And you can get to the bottom of it. But yeah, the way to do it is to go down the dismal. Uh, I think there's another way There's around. another way that you can go all the way around, but it is still a challenging yeah. trail. Either way, it's a full day hi- hike. Right. It is a full day hike to get to the bottom of the falls. And it's not a single trail. It's kind of a mix of several of them. So we didn't cover that in this particular episode. We just covered the single Ravencliff Falls trail that takes you to the Overlook. Right. And then back. Yeah. Yeah. The Overlook is gorgeous, though. It really is. It Honestly, when I say, I mean, it just, it's breathtaking. I, I love waterfalls. And when I get close to a waterfall and it's beautiful and I can hear it and you can just feel the energy coming from it. And I don't know, it's just, it's just an amazing thing. I agree. And we have some great waterfalls around here. We have some really great ones. I mean, Looking Glass Falls, Rainbow Falls, Ravencliff Falls. There's, there's too many to name. And, and every single one of them has its own personality. It has its own unique features and it has its own challenges or lack thereof like if you want to see looking glass falls you can park your car and look at it out the window that's how close it is yeah so so but ravencliff falls was was really nice and the trail itself was an interesting trail there there's not a lot of views along the way except for the little unique features of the flora and the rock formations and all that stuff makes it really interesting. Footing wasn't a problem, I didn't find, Donna. There wasn't a lot of rocks or roots to have to walk over. There were some roots that, I, I mean, I really had to pay attention. I want to mention, too, that at the, I, I'm calling it a gazebo. I don't know if it's a gazebo. It's a covered pavilion kind of thing. They're at the Overlook. Some We've been to some waterfalls where people have brought drones to fly a drone to get really good drone pictures of waterfalls. This particular overlook had a sign that said no drone zone. So don't, I mean, that's just one more thing to have to hike in with. And then if you get there and then there's this no drone zone sign and you can't use it, then you got to hike out. Well, I mean, either way, you got to hike out with it. But, but yeah, just, just putting that out there. I mean, if you're a rule breaker and want to bring a drone to get pictures, then, you know. I'm not going to tell on you, but, you know. But be aware somebody might. And you might get stopped and probably fined because it said it was a, a an FAA violation there. Is that really? Yeah, That's... on the sign there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So just keep that in mind, listeners. If you're, a, if you're a, a drone pilot, just don't bring it on this one. Yeah. Skip it. Now, one thing that we didn't see were mountain bikers and or signs that said mountain bikers could or could not be on there. Yeah. Now, when we asked, they said, eh, they discourage it, but it's not pr- explicitly prohibited. So both times we went, we haven't seen them. Yeah. And there are some spots where I think that they would be challenging. Some of the, the canopies are kind of low. Oh, yeah. And uh, the rock formations that, co- that come in and out, that they're, I think they would have a hard time with it. I don't see... I don't see it as being a popular mountain biking. There were there were three downed trees that two we went under and one we went over and I didn't have a problem with any of them. Yeah, one of the downed trees was at one point four miles in. 
So just keep that in mind. You have to go under that one. And then there was another one that you had to go over a little bit further back. But yeah, none of them were particularly challenging. I didn't. The two that, that I had to go under, I didn't even have to take my backpack off. It, my backpack maybe brushed the tree a little bit, but there was, there was, they were kind of down at an angle and I could just sort of like dip under a little bit. And I'm not, you know, the most, like I said, I'm, you know, an unfit hiker. So they were probably about maybe four to five foot clearance. So not too bad. You don't have to, you know, duck walk through them or anything like yeah. that. You can basically just bend over and get. And the one, them. the one that, that you have to step over is not, that, that one's not, it's very low to the ground. Yeah, maybe, maybe 18 inches tall at the, at the most, probably closer to 12. It's not, it's not very high. Now there is a set of steps, 0.9 miles in. It's four sets that go down, which is fine. <laughs> but then you got four steps, four sets of steps to go up. Yeah. Some of the steps are very shallow, as in... The distance between one step and the next is maybe four to five inches, and some of them are pretty steep. So keep that in mind, listeners, as you're taking this trail that you may have to encounter, you know, uneven steps. But for the most part, the footing I found was was pretty good. And and on the the steeper inclined steps, there was handrails. Yeah, I appreciate the handrails. Yeah, I do too. One thing about this trail, Donna, also is that between the trailhead and the apex, there's no official seating. There's no benches or anything like that, but there are tons of rocks that you can sit on. We sat on several of them along the way. Yeah. So, listeners, if you're thinking about, hey, where, where is a good place to stop? There's plenty of places that you can sit on a boulder or a rock. That's pretty comfortable and, you know, you can get there in addition to the little picnic area that we told you about earlier. Right. Yeah, there's no bathrooms, um, but there is a bathroom at the Caesars Head State Park Visitor Center. That bathroom does not have running water to wash your hands. So bring hand sanitizer or they have this pump, water pump around back behind the bathrooms that you can kind of wash your hands with that. There's no soap. And there's no towels. So, yeah, as she said, kind of kind of bring your own stuff. It's better than a porta potty Sure. Oh, yeah. And they, and they do a good job of keeping it clean. Yeah. So th- there's, there's no bathroom at the parking area, none at the apex. So if you do have to use the restroom, by all means, please use it either at the, the welcome center, the visitor center there at Caesars Head State Park, which is half a mile from the trailhead, or another place, yeah. Donna, which we're going to talk about now. Yeah. So, we don't normally do this, listeners, but we may actually start making this part of our, our weekly podcast. I- I'd love to hear from you if you find this interesting or not. So, we like to support local businesses any chance we get. Mm-hmm. And in this particular instance... We weren't looking to support a particular local business, but after the trail, I was hungry for lunch. And around this area, there is almost nothing, nowhere to eat, no gas stations for miles and miles and miles, except this one place called the Mountain, ha- Mountain House at Caesar's Head Coffee Shop. Don't right. I want you to tell them about it. Okay, so it's really, really close to the Caesar's Head State Park Welcome Center. It's you you'll see it as you're coming up the road to Caesar's. We we've seen it a couple of times and said, "Huh, I wonder if we should stop in there." So we stopped in there today, and I'm so glad we did. We now we saw it was a coffee shop, so we weren't a hundred percent sure because we were hungry for lunch, and so yeah, we were like, "Oh, we need more than coffee." They have more than coffee, trust me, and it was so good. They have sandwiches. And yeah, they're so good. They have amazing sandwiches. They have soups. They have pastries. They have homemade fudges, ice cream, fresh made, homemade waffles. Soup? Of all kinds. Yeah. Yeah. So what I had today is something that I've never had before. And that's a pimento cheese and turkey sandwich. And the pimento cheese is handmade there with fresh local vegetables. Mm -hmm. And it was incredible. Yeah. 
And I had the chicken salad sandwich. Now, this was chicken salad with, um, like, the cranberries and walnuts, and it. it was so good. And it was on a croissant. And, the, you know, they warm up the bread and toast, and, oh, it was so good. And then I had tomato bisque soup, I believe. Yeah, I had the cheddar broccoli. And so normally I, I don't eat very much at lunch, and you don't either. I don't either, And yeah. we both finished our meals. Yeah. And we left stuff just from a soup and, and sandwich. And it was so great. Now, they had some some really interesting fudges there, too. Typically, listeners, Donna and I don't eat sweets. Yeah. We, we just don't. We typically. try and stay away from sugar. Yeah, Bad we try to. But they had this vanilla lavender fudge that it was beautiful white cream with with purple lavender swirls in it. And I was like, you know what? I just want to try a little piece of it. So I bought a piece. And it is... It is subtle, but it's so savory and delicious. And Donna, you you got one too. Yeah, I got the um. Oh shoot, what was it? It was. Uh, it was the praline. Yes, thank you. It was the praline fudge, and yeah, I I took one tiny bite of it, and then one other tiny bite of it, and then another <laughs> quite a bit bigger bite, and then. Yeah, it was just I love praline. It was well, it's it's like a vanilla fudge with praline in the middle, caramel and praline in um and then some more white fudge on the bottom. It was... They had they had probably what a dozen different fudges there. Yeah. Yeah, I, something like that. Yeah, that and ice cream too. Uh, yeah, and the ice cream. We met with one of the owners, James, and he was really nice and he explained everything. He told us how they make all the stuff there fresh. And they also have a neat little gift shop there uh, where local artists sell their own goods. So all this stuff in there is local. Yeah. Yeah. And I, they had like these really pretty wooden earrings and just a lot of stuff. They had uh, some, some Christmas ornaments and it was just a really neat shop. It was a really neat shop. And this place is not very big, yet somehow they were able to fit a bunch of seating in there. They had indoor seating, they had outdoor seating, and then they had seating that's kind of hybrid. It was covered from the elements, but it wasn't heated, and it was really nice. They had fresh water set out. Yeah. It was it was a really really neat place. And it, I mean they had artisan coffees and artisan teas there. They had all kinds of stuff, as well as bathrooms if you need a bathroom and you want to be able to wash your hands. Yeah. With they it. They have an Instagram wall, too. Yeah, so there's this neat little decorated wall where you can take a picture in front of it and uh, put it on Instagram. Mm -hmm. So it, this is a neat spot. If, if any of our listeners are out there and they're getting ready to go to either Caesars Head State Park to look at the Overlook or they're going on any of the many hikes there at Caesars Head, we encourage you to stop there. This was the first time we'd been there, you know, meeting, meeting James. And his staff was really nice. They could not have been more pleasant. Yeah. So please, we encourage you to go there, support local artists, support local business people, and support local commerce. Right. So Mountain House at Caesar's Head Coffee Shop, they have a sign out front that says, last stop on the mountain, go potty, eat and drink, and get some souvenirs. So yeah, it's they're, they're definitely... Coffee, waffles, fudge, ice cream, sandwiches, local crafts, and hot chocolate. I think they even have hot cider. They do have hot cider. We didn't try that because we were just so hungry. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so if you want to check them out on the web, it's mountainhousech.com. And you can look for them on Facebook at Mountain House at Caesars Head on Facebook and Instagram. I got lots of pictures and we'll put those on the, on the website. We'll as put well. them on the website as well. So that was our hike this week donna what did you think was this uh what how would you rate the difficulty on this you know we were talking about this on the trail on our way back and you were like so what do you think and i said you know it really depends on where i am on this trail like when you ask me that question am i heading up or am i going you know level ground or going downhill my my opinions and mood i i changed <laughs> depending on what was going on on the trail. But I think we decided that this is a break a sweat plus. It's something between break a sweat and pain bringer. It's not, exa it's not as yeah, hard. Yeah, between break a sweat and feel the burn. Oh, and yeah. feel, yeah, not the pain, yeah. Yeah. 
It is. So if we gauge this against the Sulphur Springs Trail that we did a couple weeks ago, which was definitely a break of sweat. No, that, that was definitely a feel the burn. Sulphur Springs was definitely feel the burn. It was close, but not quite as difficult, I think, as Sulphur Springs. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah b- break a sweat plus. And if you're very, very new to hiking or, you know, as out of shape as we were when we first did it, it's a feel the burn hike. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that. Would you recommend this to anybody coming to the area? I would. I, w- I definitely... 100% I would recommend going to the Caesars Head Visitor Center and that park, just that parking lot and just seeing the overlook. And I know we're going to talk about Devil's Kitchen pretty soon here. But yeah, the overlook there. So at Caesars Head State Park, there's a, a large parking lot and they have a visitor center with a, a gift shop there. They're actually remodeling the gift shop in there, or the visitor center. We haven't been in the last couple of times we've been to that parking lot, but... The overlook is reason. Yeah. So to get to the overlook, you park in the parking lot and you walk along this partially paved, partially boardwalk path. It's from the farthest parking spot. It's maybe 100 yards. And from the closest, it's probably 20 yards to the overlook. And the overlook is spectacular. So we could post all the pictures in the world of the overlook. None of them would do them justice. Yeah. None of them would do him justice. So please, if you're at Caesars Head or even if you're near Caesars Head State Park, if you're within an hour of it. Even if like you can't, if you're not able to, if you're not very mobile at all, if you're not a hiker, if you're not able to walk much, I I think. It's very wheelchair friendly. Yeah, it's it's ramps. There's no steps. Now, you may not be able to get down onto the onto the rock face part of the overlook, but you can see everything yeah. from, from the wheelchair You'll still get area. a view. Oh, yeah. It's spectacular. And you can actually have a picnic right there. There's picnic tables. Several. Yeah. Several picnic tables. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so, so stop there, and, and Devil's Kitchen is right there, and we're going to talk about Devil's Kitchen now. Yeah. Okay, so our fun fact today is about Devil's Kitchen at Caesars Head State Park, the visitor center parking area. So this is not to be mistaken for Devil's Fork State Park, which is only 33 miles away from the Devil's Kitchen at Caesars Head State Park Visitor Center. Two totally different things. There's a lot of devils, though. What's going on here? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, Should we be nervous about living in this area? I think it's fine. Yeah, probably. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Um, but yeah, Devil's Kitchen, different from Devil's Fork State Park. Devil's Kitchen is, is a much smaller thing. So it's a really interesting geological formation. It's in the northern Greenville County, South Carolina, near the border of Transylvania County, North Carolina. This is, the again, the parking area of uh, the Caesars Head State Park Visitor Center. So this is a narrow passageway between two giant rocks. Well, it used to be one rock that split. They say it was a natural process that created it. But there's another explanation if you choose to believe it. I'm going to go I choose to believe it. I don't even I have I don't even know what it is. (laughs) I'm choosing to believe it's not a natural phenomenon. Okay. All right. All right. Well, just wait. Just wait. So so there's a, for, for as far as the natural process route, there's two explanations that way. So we're going to go into the natural, pro- the possible natural process. So both Ooh, of these. Boring. <laughs> you might learn something. Maybe. Who wants okay. to learn on a podcast? Okay. <laughs> Explanation number one is that thousands of years ago, spoiler alert, both of these are going to say thousands of years ago. So thousands of years ago, as water on the mountain froze and expanded, it created pressure on this rock. Now, when I say rock, I mean rock, like really, like a really, really big rock. It's probably from where you stand, 25, 30 feet tall to the top. It's big. This is not a, this is not, we're not talking about It's not about like a, a rock that you pick up and put no, in your pocket. This is, a, this is the side of the mountain. Yeah. Yeah. This is, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Really, really big piece of the mountain. So they're saying water? Um, that water, uh, yeah, that it froze and expanded. And like, it, I guess it somehow got into the rock and then expanded when it froze and created this crack. But that's, that's not the 
It doesn't seem right. I don't buy it. Yeah. No, I don't buy it. Okay. Not as big as this crack is? No way that happened. And, and, yeah, and this... I don't know. It feel, it seems very smooth too. I I don't know. But water could water can do a lot of things. Water can part mountains, but yeah. yeah, I don't think that's what happened here. So, explanation number 2, again, thousands of years ago, an immense amount of heat and pressure caused part of the mountain, the rock, to split away creating a narrow passage. So that's explanation number 2 if you want to go with possible natural occurrences. So a large amount of heat and what else? Heat and pressure. So I'm guessing like maybe this has something to do with tectonic plates or maybe almost like earthquake kind of. I, I mean, just you and I have been through here, what, half a dozen times, maybe more? Yeah. I think that's the only real explanation, it, except for whatever it is you're about to say, <laughs> which I'm going to believe anyway. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, also, you know... I. I don't have any explanation that has anything to do with Bigfoot, but maybe he had something to do with this. I don't know. Of course he did, Donna. Okay. Of course he did. Okay. All right. So so this rock is called granite gneiss, but it's spelled gneiss, G-N-E-I-S-S. And apparently multiple, like other places, this type of rock, here it broke at a clean 90 degree angle. And I think it does this. Like, I think that's what, this rock does when it breaks is it breaks at clean 90 degree angles but it just does feel like it'd be more like almost an earthquake event i don't know i'm not i love the symmetry of a of a rock breaking at 90 degree angles we... so so nice has now become my favorite rock okay <laughs> um but we but remember when we went up to grandfather mountain on your way up to grandfather mountain you see split rock and sphinx sphinx rock yeah. And these two rocks are kind of, they remind me of Devil's Kitchen. They're huge rocks. And if I remember correctly, you can almost kind of walk through a little bit. And it seemed like they sort of split like that, too. I'm going to have to do some research and see. I, I believe they those actually have an explanation near them. And I think they were formed during a tectonic event. Okay. All right. Yeah. But they, yeah, I just, I remembered that when I was looking at this. So, so here's the other explanation for Let's Devil's Kitchen. Let's hear it. So this dates back to when there were Scottish and Irish immigrants that oh, lived that's in the right. area. Yeah. Finally. <laughs> I finally get to break out my only halfway passable accent. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Is there, are there any names? Uh, I don't have any names, but I, I, I think, like. I think, okay, I'm going to call him Angus McTavish. Okay. All, All right. right. All right. Old Angus. Yeah. That's right. I picture his wife being the one to tell him this this story and like to try and discourage him from from what okay so this was the story so these settlers would often brew their own alcohol moonshine in that area sweet and somebody started a story that said that the devil also used to use this this area as his own kitchen to make moonshine and he one day made a particularly hot brew. And I, I saw that terminology, hot brew, a couple of times in a couple of different versions of this story. So that must mean they must have been just calling like really strong moonshine hot brew. I think moonshine is boiled. So because it, it goes through those cooling things. So maybe it is talking about physical temperature rather than strength of alcohol. But you know what? If well, the devil's making it, mm -hmm. probably both. Right. So listen to the, yeah, the rest of the story. So one drop of the devil's moonshine spilled on this rock and it split the mountain. It, it made it crack. So that's the, um, that's why it's called the devil's kitchen because the devil was making really, really strong moonshine. I don't think just hot, physically hot moonshine would have made this rock crack like that. I don't know, but I, I believe it. It is the most logical explanation to this formation that you can possibly give me. So was this narrow passageway created by geological means? Or was this created by an accidental drop of some really potent moonshine the devil was making? B Bigfoot. You, you decide. Forgot, you forgot Sasquatch. Well, the, the, the Sasquatch was probably helping the devil make the moonshine. He I probably, would think so, right? Yeah. I Look, having read up, watched movies, and, and followed Bigfoot stuff as much as I have. Yeah. He's 100% an alcoholic. 
Oh, no, no. 100%. Stop disparaging. You're going to get a lawsuit. That's, no, I'm not saying it's a bad thing for him. There's probably a big Bigfoot out there that's like going to come. Uh, you think he's a teetotaler? I don't know. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Bigfoot's a teetotaler? I mean, maybe. Who knows? The Bigfoot, I don't know, agenda. So they're gonna... it's, it's Big Bigfoot. <laughs> trying, big Bigfoot is trying to pass on their, their I don't agenda know. to you. You love Bigfoot. I do love Bigfoot. Listeners, I have Bigfoot, little Bigfoot figurines all over my house. I also am currently drinking out of a Bigfoot coffee mug. I have Bigfoot shirts. I have Bigfoot hats. I'm yeah. a huge fan of Bigfoot. And if you're out there, Bigfoot, listening to this podcast, shout out to you, bro. Yeah, you Next need... time I'm in the woods, say hi. No, you need to apologize right now for calling him an alcoholic. Drug. I didn't call that Bigfoot an alcoholic. I said probably one is. Okay. And just based on the law of averages, there's got to be a Bigfoot who is an alcoholic. All right. All right. So maybe, you know what? You know, I, I'm just now thinking of this. So there were a lot of Scottish ancestors that settled in this area. That's, that's just a known fact. That's where Hillbilly came from. And we'll cover that in a different podcast, folks. That story's fun, too. I wonder if Sasquatch is not really an ape creature, but just a really hairy Scotchman. <laughs> I mean... Doesn't that make sense? Maybe. He's just really hairy. I mean, I've seen some hairy Scots guys. Yeah, and, and you know, they had that, like, rock-throwing contests and that's, stuff like that's that. That's right. Yep. Throw the stones. Yep. So, the biggest, baddest, meanest of them. Yeah, just became the, the mythical creature. I'm buying it. Mm-hmm. So, this, this Devil's Kitchen, you and I have been through it. What... Just so, so you listeners know, we're going to put a video on our YouTube page of Donna narrating her way through Devil's Kitchen. But why don't you tell them, if they can't get to the video right now, why don't you tell them what it's like? Okay, so you, you go to the Overlook, you walk from the parking lot to the Overlook, and you enjoy that view for a minute. And then if you walk to, it's kind of like along the left side, you'll, you'll come across this really narrow, really steep stairway down into the devil's kitchen. And you can walk through between these two, between the two pieces of this rock. Um, it's, you're walking on ground on dirt and then there's just rock up each side. And you kind of, I mean, I, okay, so. It's maybe, maybe 18 inches wide. It's pretty narrow. There might be some parts that are two foot, but it's never more than that. It is very, very narrow. A lot of people can't walk, you through. know, regular. You have to yeah, yeah. shimmy sideways through it. Right. I, I had to kind of, and also because the ground is, is uneven. Mm -hmm, yeah. It's, it's at an angle too. But so, yeah, you're kind of leaning. Like my hands are on one rock and the other side of the rock is at my back and I'm just kind of scooting sideways through there. But if you're claustrophobic, it's not for you. Yeah. If you're claustrophobic, it's not for you. Yeah. You're probably not going to even want to go down the stairs and you don't have to. You can go through Devil's Kitchen, but you don't have to. Yeah. You can totally bypass it. What is it about, I don't know, 50 feet long? Probably something like that. I was actually looking for the measurements before we did this podcast yeah. and I couldn't find yeah. the actual me measurements. I don't know if, if anybody, do you, Roy, do you remember? A uh, couple years ago, we went to Chattanooga on vacation, and we went to Rock City Gardens in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And there's this thing in Rock City Gardens called the Fat Man Squeeze at Rock City. Do you remember that? I do. And yeah. I was a fat man back then, and yeah. I had a really hard time getting through it. It, it is really... Okay, so that... I did find the measurements on that. that. That one is 30 feet high, 45 feet long, and 20 inches wide at the narrowest. So... This is kind of reminiscent of that. It's not as tall. It's not as long. But oh, it, I think it's as long. You think so? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I do, it, may, it might not be as tall, but it, it absolutely is as long. And I think the fat man squeeze at Rock City in Chattanooga is also more straight up and down. This is more at an angle. It's at an angle. So, listeners, that, that's kind of the reason why it's tough. You can't walk straight up and down. You kind of have to lean yeah. to one side or the other. If you're going from the stair side, you're going to have to lean to your right because it leans at that angle. 
or as most people do, they just sidestep shimmy through I, it. Yeah, I sidestep forward a little bit. I yeah, I think I I definitely st- sidestep shimmy through the end of it. It's it is a very fascinating feature, and I love the story you just gave us about it. That the devil. I would like to have, you know. I kind of wonder. Maybe we create our own myth about it instead of the devil dropping some moonshine. Maybe it's just some Scottish people who accidentally blew up a rock when they overdid their still. Uh, I think we did kind of just add to the story a little bit by by incorporating Bigfoot into it. How do we make that canon? What, who do I need to call at the park service I to, don't think to get you, that put on the placards? I, yeah, I don't, I don't I'll know. make some calls. I'll make some calls. Okay. All right. I'll be doing something else while you're doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, if you haven't realized yet, Donna's ashamed of me. I'm not ashamed of you. <laughs> I'm entertained by you. <laughs> well, that was a fun story, Donna. Thank you for sharing that with me, especially yeah. and, and the listeners. Yeah. And so now we're going to talk about our uh, equipment review this week. And this week, it's about some of the tech that I use. Okay. So today's product review is about the app that I use, Kamoot. So it's K-O-M-O-O-T, and you can get it on Google Play, the Apple App Store. It has a smartwatch companion for Google Watches, for any Android smartwatch, and for any Mac OS smart, so the Apple Watch. And I really like it. I used to use All Trails as my hiking app, Donna, but I've switched because All Trails does not have a smartwatch companion, and it's so nice to keep your phone in your pocket and be able to track things using your watch since you already have it anyway. Yeah. So here's some of the information, or some of the features that Kamut provides. It gives you detailed information on distance, time spent in motion, your travel speed, elevation changes and much, much more. So when I give you the information at the beginning of this ep- these episodes, listeners, that's all taken from Kamut. I'm not remembering this. It's straight in the app. So once you start your, your hike, and you can do it with anything. You can do a run. You can do a, a, a bike. You can do a swim. You can do a, any physical activity, and it'll, it'll track that for you. But particularly for hikes, since this is a hiking podcast, it keeps track of all that, including the elevation changes. So it, it is smart enough to know when you have stopped for breaks without having to manually stop it and when you start again. So when I give you the active time, that's really the time that we are actually moving. I like the elevation information too. Oh, the elevation map is fantastic. So after your, after your they call them tours on Kamut, after your tour is done, you get this nice little side map that will show you all of the elevation changes that you made from start to finish. And you can scroll through to find out exactly where you were at any point in time. It's so tremendously detailed. And the app is free. What you do pay for, if you want to, and you don't have to by any means, is to download the area maps. And I'll tell you why this is a good thing if you can afford it. Most of the trails that we go on here in upstate South Carolina, you have no cell service and certainly no Wi-Fi. So when you're out there, if you don't have the area downloaded, you won't be able to tell where in your pre-planned tour you are. Now, you can still start a tour without any service whatsoever and just go wherever you want. But if you plan your tour, plan your route ahead of time, it has to be downloaded in order for it to be able to track hey, am I actually on this part of the tour that you're supposed to be on? Yeah. One of the other great things about it, we haven't used this yet, but we probably will in the future. You can share real-time location with somebody else. So if I were to go on a long hike and you were stuck home working, God forbid, I could share my location with you so that you would know where I was at any given time. And if you somehow lose track of me, if I don't show up on time, You'll be able to know the exact last spot where I was, and if I'm, if my app is still running, you can tell when I was, you know, where I am at this particular moment. That's particularly good on some of these long hikes, especially if you're a, 
uh, maybe less experienced and you decide to do the dismal trail and then realize you got to the bottom and you're not making your way up anytime soon, there's no cell service down there. You're not getting any cell signal. So that's really useful. We haven't we haven't used it yet, but I can see some real benefits in that. Yeah, there's some practical uses for that. Sure. Go find you having lunch with Bigfoot or something. Oh man. That would be so great. That can you imagine? So what would you do if you found me, if I didn't show up for a couple hours and you found me deep in the woods off of a trail somewhere and I was braiding Bigfoot's hair? <laughs> First of all, I would be the one to braid the hair. I don't know how to braid. I have no <laughs> idea. I have no hair, listeners. So for those of you who don't know me, I am bald. So I I don't... And I didn't have any daughters. I had a stepdaughter, but she was older when, when Don and I got married. So she, she didn't... It would have been creepy if I started braiding her she hair. She wouldn't sit for you to braid no, her hair. No, she wouldn't sit. So I don't know how to braid hair. But I'd try on a Sasquatch. You I'd sure would. try. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> That's a good idea. And I don't know what I would do. I think I'd probably just take out my phone and take some pictures and put them on the website. <laughs> that would be the right thing to do. <laughs> that would be the right thing to do. But you can only get blurry pictures of Bigfoot as uh, evidenced by every other picture of them out there. Mm -hmm. So you can also take photos on your trail tours with the Kamut app. You can add notes to it. You can publish your, your route for others to use. You can write reviews for your routes. And they also have uh, user-submitted trails. So I typically create my own route in Kamut just because I know exactly where I want to go. And a lot of the user... Uh, so most people who use Kamut are experienced hikers. So they'll do longer trails or more difficult ones, or they'll do parts of some and another. So when I plan my weekly tour with Kamut for our podcast, I will create my own, which is another wonderful thing that you can do with Kamut that you can't do with all trails. And so you can create you can create your trail and your route and you can publish it for others to use. You can add photos, which I did today. I added a photo of the uh of the waterfall at the end, Donna. Mm -hmm. And you can also uh share those trails with other friends. So if you were to get a Kamut subscription, Donna, or it's not really a subscription, just create an account. It's free. I could share my trails with you and we could tag each other and, and we could share the trail as if we completed it together, which we do. Which we did. Yeah. So again, uh, listeners, Kamut doesn't pay me. <laughs> I paid for the download service. It's a one-time fee to download the map. So it's not like I have to pay a monthly subscription or anything. And it's very reasonable. And I am not affiliated with them in any way. They have not given us any money. So my review is a pure, unfettered review from a consumer. And I take it for what it's worth. Do you need an app to help you get out there hiking? Absolutely not. Do I recommend it? I actually do. I think it'll help you better understand your route. You can plan better. And it'll help keep track of your stuff. So I have a whole history of my trails of my hiking trails in Kamut, I can go back at any time and look and see, hey, I completed Ravencliff Falls in May of last year, and I completed it in February of this year. Did my timing improve? So am I getting faster? Am I getting slower? You know, what am I taking less breaks? All that information is saved for you, and it's good information to just keep on hand. Yeah. Yeah, this time was way better because we stopped at the Mountain House at Caesar's Head coffee shop and had lunch afterwards. So I think that improved the experience and our time. <laughs> Actually, our time was significantly better this time than it was last May. Yeah. By like 20 minutes of actual moving time. Okay. Yeah, so we're doing, we're doing really well. So that's the review, folks. That's Kamut. Feel free to use it. Like I said, the, the creating accounts free. You don't have to purchase anything. And last time I'll say this, you don't need it to get out on the trails and hike. Yeah, but just it helps. Yeah, just look for the red markers on the trees for this trail. This was uh, red markers. Oh, thank you. Yes, this was a red marker trail. I had a hard time seeing them. They are faded tremendously, and I'm red, green, colorblind, so I had a hard time seeing them anyway. But I was his eyes for this trip. She's I'm, my eyes. Yeah, I got the. I saw them. All right, so that's it, guys. Kamut. Uh, Kamut.com. You can go in, create your own account. It's free and uh, check it out. It's 
it's my recommended hiking app. Yeah. So that's the show this week, guys. We covered the Ravencliff Falls Trail at Caesars Head State Park here in upstate South Carolina. It's a beautiful trail, tons of interesting features along the way, and you get the big payoff at the end with the overlook to the Ravencliff Falls waterfall. Now, the waterfall is far away. It's a good mile, but you get a really clean view of it, and there's plenty of seating there to stop and have lunch and enjoy. So overall, Donna, I love this trail. Yeah, so thanks so much for listening, and please subscribe to us on whatever podcast app you use, and be sure to leave us a review. That's how our show grows. Feel free to check out our trail photos at casualclimbers.podbean.com. And if you have a question, comment, or just want to drop us a line, you can reach us at casualclimberspodcast at gmail.com. So, yeah, this was really fun. We didn't see Bigfoot, but maybe next time. Next time. Yeah. I, I keep knocking on trees. No. To try to get him. He doesn't, actually. I do knock on trees. Okay. We're, we're, we'll see you guys out on the, see you out on the maybe trail. Maybe we'll see Bigfoot, too. God, I hope so. <laughs> All right. <laughs>